What's cracking, big dog? Oh, oh, oh. Welcome, bike, to the channel. Welcome, bike, to the headquarters. My name is Nicholas. This is BDGE. Big dogs gotta eat fantasy football. We are wrapping up our must own episodical series today. The last three weeks have comprised of our must own running backs going from rounds one through nine, round by round, lining them up knocking them down did the same thing with wide receivers every monday is running backs every tuesday is wide receivers today we will rip off round seven through nine i really liked prepping for this video this was a really really solid group of wide receivers that i haven't necessarily got to dive into all the way it's like the shallow end of a pool but i said fuck it i'm going full concussion and we dove in feeling good i'm feeling loose i'm feeling free i slept i got some i got some rem i hit, I hit that rem for the first time since like 2012 last night you don't want to see me when i get some sleep i got my big ass mason jar full of ice coffee cut my hair like i don't know what i don't know why the sudden urge to cut my hair like i haven't had short hair on the sides in a while but it feels really freeing so last night at like 10 30 for whatever reason i was just like i'm just gonna shave my hair and i did it and now i feel like a new person i'm ready for fantasy football talk y'all better be ready for fantasy season and you know how i know you're not if you have not gone to draftnowfantasy.com and grabbed a board for your league already done been finna tell you about this if your league drafts in person draftnowfantasy.com's got you covered with the board 14 teams, 20 rounds, comes included with all the player stickers. Pretty much every relevant player. I know since everyone's going to be drafting Eddie Lacy this year, you're probably going to have to write the name in on one of the blank stickers. Draft board, stickers, Lombardi trophy. It's in the kit. So is the sash. I finally got it right. It was a satchel. It was a sage. It was a sash. First time ever I got it right. That thing, the big pink thing, it's actually a sash. It goes around your collarbone for the loser of your league. This is the kit from draftnowfantasy.com. When you use promo code BDGE on their site to get the kit, you will get 10% off plus free shipping. So I have everyone in your league throw in five bucks and you're set for the fantasy season. Be a good commissioner. Be a good league member. If you're just a league member and you're like, yo, commish, text them over the link, which I will link in the description down below. Use the promo code BDGE and y'all are set. I'm ready to talk about these must own wide receivers rounds seven through nine. Let us tuck our shirts in. Stop yelling. LSE. Round seven gets interesting for wide receivers. We want to target running backs early, right? Rounds one, two, maybe rounds three. And then we want to reserve those middle rounds for all the value we can squeeze out of the pass catcher position, right? Rounds three, four, five, six, seven. Could literally rip off like four or five wide receivers in a row. However, sometimes you're going to be in tight end premium leagues. Sometimes you're going to be in super flex leagues where one or two of those picks are going to have to go to other positions besides running backs and wide receivers, which leads you to the middle to late rounds of your drafts, round seven, eight, and nine, where you might have to grab a wide receiver, and this is primo position still. As you can see by the round seven ADP, and again, this ADP is per four for four, which I will link in the description, completely free to see. The CBS, the ESPN, the FFPC, which is high stakes leagues, BB10s, NFL, Yahoo, all into one place to give you the ADP of the entire industry, all different types of leagues, and expert versus novice. So this is the best way to look at things. And in the seventh round, you could see absolute slappers like this this round is just filled with value at wide receiver we have hollywood brown we have jarvis landry tyler boyd michael gallup julian edelman will fuller a lot of you guys probably like michael gallup that's a little rich for my taste all the way up at wide receiver 30 jarvis landry i don't like the fact that he's coming into the year with a serious hip injury no he's been like cleared he's not on the pup list but the timetable is pretty long and that scares me so when i could just get the same thing from jarvis landry that i can in tyler boyd who's actually healthy i would rather go that way so we're gonna look at the four players that i have highlighted here in hollywood brown tyler boyd julian edelman and will fuller because those are my favorite picks in these rounds and as you can see we're gonna get into round eight and there's really no one i like in round eight so there's a good chance one of these guys falls to you in round eight and that would certify as my must own wide receiver in that round. Let's start with Mr. Hollywood Brown. So Marquise Hollywood Brown, the first wide receiver off the board in the 2019 NFL draft. The first wide receiver selected. This was a very, very, very good rookie wide receiver class. And he was the first one to go off the board in the first round by a very good franchise. And that really tells me all I need to know. When they're buying into a player who is coming into the year with a Liz Frank injury, who is coming into the year knowing that he's going to have to play with a screw in his foot for the entirety of the season, yet they still invest their very first pick, first wide receiver off the board, first round, right around where they grabbed Lamar Jackson. That is firework number one for me. Harbaugh came out after the season 
he admitted that Brown was playing at far less than 100% for the entirety of the year. And he quote unquote, couldn't really practice at all in 2019. And I know you all think I'm just making shit up over here. I'm only technically a doctor, but we can talk to real doctors, right? We got one of my favorite follows on Twitter at FB injury doc, Edwin Porras of the fantasy points as a rookie with metal in his freaking foot, his freaking foot. All right. We got to emphasize the freak in there. Hollywood Brown averaged more points per game than Deontay Johnson, Juju, Brandon Cooks, one point fewer than DK Metcalf, Adam Thielen, Curtis Samuel, Preston Williams. Key there. Metal in his freaking foot. They knew not to push that situation, okay? It's the reason why I'm off Evan Ingram, because he's coming off list rank. He's going to have metal in his foot. Last year, Brown played on just 52% of the team's snaps. The volume wasn't encouraging, which is going to happen when you play on 52% of your team's snaps. How many times can you really be targeted on a team that doesn't throw the ball much and you're not on the field for much of their plays? The efficiency, however, was top notch. Marquise Brown ranked number six in the NFL in QB rating when targeted and number eight in fantasy points per route run. All of these numbers can be found completely free on playerprofiler.com. I cannot wait to see this kid play. He did not get to participate in the NFL Combine, but we're pretty sure that he was going to run somewhere in the four threes when it comes to 40. But that speed does not make him a one-trick pony. We look at Matt Harmon's reception perception, which is one of my favorite resources in the fantasy industry. He goes and charts individual game logs of players, and then he looks at their success versus man coverage, press coverage, zone coverage, all this stuff, and he puts them into percentiles, and he puts it into just success rate overall. Brown was winning on nearly every route, and it's because of his speed. Defenders don't have the luxury of trying to jam him at the line. So even if he's small, even if you think he can't beat those guys at the line of scrimmage because he's not strong enough, he can't push off them, they have no reason to play on top of him because he's way too fucking fast. It's the reason he ranked number four among all NFL wide receivers last year in cushion given by opposing coverages. Per Matt Harmon, despite not being at 100%, Marquise Brown was awesome in reception perception. Do not want to leave a draft without him. 73.6% success rate versus man coverage, 83rd percentile balance route tree showing a full skill set. So you can see the two charts here, success by different routes. That's a lot of green over there. And then route tree percentage on the right. So you can see he was running a variety of routes. He was not a one trick pony running posts, corners, outs, digs, comebacks. It was all there. Curls, slants. The dude was balling. The other thing to consider is just the lack of competition for targets in Baltimore. Brown's raw stats, again, weren't there. But when you look at his numbers relative to the other wide receivers on the position, there's no doubt that he was the alpha there. He accounted for 41% of all Baltimore wide receiver touchdowns touchdowns and receiving yards, 40% of their receptions, 37% of the targets, and 67% of their 40 plus yard receptions. They have almost nothing outside of Mark Andrews. So by default, Marquis Brown's going to be the alpha on the outside there. He gets the league's reigning MVP, who's going to be passing the ball more. They're going to be in more friendly game script situations where Lamar Jackson's not sitting out the fourth quarter of a quarter of the games that they played in. The team just led the NFL in scoring 31.9 points per game. This is a wide receiver that you need to have on your team. And I know there are reports starting to surface about Des Bryant coming. Like, dude, how many times does this story need to be written? These old players come back way past their prime because you know their name you think they're going to be a thing like geriatric optimism has to be the single biggest killer of fantasy drafts what is des bryant going to do have a couple behind the shoulder catches in the end zone like that's not what marquise brown does anyway you think 33 year old des bryant's going to get down the field and catch hell marys instead of Mar I, my i'm not i'm not i'm not wasting any more time on des i'm just not i'm not doing it i don't have the time i don't have the energy brown gives you weekly wide receiver one upside that's not something you could say about almost any wide receiver being picked in round seven or eight of fantasy draft he finished as a wide receiver one in three of 14 weeks last season i expect that to at least double in 2020 given a full snap outlet he saw a near 19 percent target share as a rookie not healthy and playing on 51 percent of the snaps. I would assume that number is going to be closer to 23, 24%. And now you're starting to flirt with high end wide receiver two type volume with monster splash weeks. He is the perfect upside flex play at this point in the draft. Do not leave your drafts without Marquise Hollywood Brown. That name will be fitting because he will be a household celebrity following 2020. Tyler Boyd is another guy that just does not get the credit that he deserves. Tyler Boyd is coming up back to back, bike to bike. 1,000 yard receiving seasons, and he is just 25. There is a very strong chance that we have not seen the peak of Tyler Boyd. There's a really strong chance that he's still 25 years old, which is a fact, not a chance, that he's just entering into his prime. I think we have gotten used to what Boyd did the last two years. 
So we see him going 1,000 yards, 1,000 yards, and we're like, okay, he's just going to continue to keep doing that. If he finished this season with 1,200 or 1,300 receiving yards, I don't think anyone would be surprised. I saw a really interesting tweet the other day, and it got me thinking, and I'm not really going to go into depth on this, but you're hearing the question go around fantasy a lot, like, who is this year's Chris Godwin? You hear Calvin Ridley. You hear DJ Chark. What if it's Tyler Boyd? What if it is Tyler Boyd? Now, the Bengals offense is going to be very different in 2020. Obviously, they're bringing Joe Burrow to be their quarterback. You get Jonah Williams back on the field, their first round pick from last year. So we're kind of like getting two first round top 12 picks back into that offense. You have AJ Green back on the field and maybe healthy. So there's a lot to be excited about in Cincinnati if you are a Bengals fan. Now, when we look at the competition for targets with Tyler Boyd, it seems like there's a lot of heads there. But when we really break it down, you have T. Higgins, who is missed all of training camp so far he is not participating he has some injury so now i'm nervous that he is going to be a complete wash for the rookie season right like rookie wide receivers very rarely produce to begin with now you combine that with a rookie wide receiver who has missed all of the summer and missed training camp like fucking forget about it so i don't expect t higgins to play a major role this year you look at john ross one the Bengals declined his fifth year option so that tells you what you what they think about him john ross misses games like like Philip Rivers' wife misses her period, right? He's never on the field. They've got no allegiance to John Ross, being that they declined his fifth-year option. They don't have a plan of him being the future of the team. Again, so no allegiance to get him on the field. He has left their training camp to go be with his wife and kid because they have developed the COVID-19 virus. So good for John Ross for doing that. Bad for his fantasy outlook. So there's a very real chance that both Higgins and John Ross don't make, make much of a factor in this offense. And then we have A.J. Green. Again, the geriatric optimism for A.J. Green. Is A.J. Green back to form? I don't know. Every training camp report says everybody's in the best shape of their life and is back to full strength, full health, elite pro bowl. If, we had a pro, if everybody was a pro bowler, that training camp beat reporter said was a pro bowler, there would actually be more pro bowlers than NFL players in a given year. Since John Ross has entered the league in 2017, he has played one fewer game than A.J. Green over that time span, okay? We're out here acting like A.J. Green at age 32 is 25-year-old A.J. Green. He's not. But given the lack of target competition there, he's probably going to be the number the number one outside wide receiver. That doesn't mean Boyd can't succeed. Boyd had 148 targets last year, which was the seventh highest number in the entire NFL over the last two seasons. So we're seeing a long sample size of this. Tyler Boyd has averaged over eight and a half targets per game. Now, this is where things are going to get fun. This is where things get interesting. This is where we dove into the big facts. And if you are learning from this video, if you are ingesting these big facts into your veins, make sure you hit the thumbs up button and make sure you subscribe to the channel because we're putting out videos like this, pieces of content like this, Picasso's every single day of thy week. There's a chance Tyler Boyd is just a very, very, very good slot receiver, right? And he's about to enter his prime. I don't think Tyler Boyd is a top 10 talent at the wide receiver position, but like if anything's proven that to us, Cooper Cup has proven that you don't need to be a top 10 talent at the wide receiver position to be a top 10 fantasy wide receiver. You just have to be in the right place at the right time, and the coach just needs to use you the right way. What I love about Joe Burrow coming in is just how much he loved throwing to the slot last year. It was scary, man. It's why Justin Jefferson's numbers were so thick. Four to five C's in there. Put together this little chart, and all this data is per sportsinfosolutions.com. So the top row is Joe Burrow's overall 2019 statistics, all right? 402 for 527, threw for 5,671 yards, 60 touchdowns. The other things are air yards, touchdown rate, on target rate. The bottom row is Joe Burrow's statistics when throwing only two receivers that lined up in the slot last year. Again, Sports Info Solutions is very analytical. They dive into these kind of things in, in depth and in niche and nuance. And this is where we could use a site like this. The percentages are the percentages of his overall statistics from last year that came from the slot. Basically half, if not more, of every category was to the slot. 50% of his completions to the slot. Over 50%. 52% of his yards were to slot receivers. 54% of his air yards. 60% of his touchdowns. His touchdown rate was 22% higher to the slot. And his on-target rate was a little bit of an increase. He's just accurate everywhere. What gets me really excited is that air yard number, okay? Because Boyd's running from the slot. So you assume average depth of target is going to be very, very, very low, all right? Last year, he ran 60% of his routes from the slot. And I think that was a product of not really having a wide receiver one on the outside. You look at the year prior when AJ Green was on the field, Boyd ran 74.1% of his routes from the slot. So you have a 14% increase when AJ Green was on the field. When I'm looking at Boyd operating on the outside versus slot, we want him to operate in the slot. The case in point, long story longer, Boyd had three games last year in which he lined up more outside than he did in the slot. In those three games, he averaged 8.5 targets, 5.3 receptions, 
48.3 yards and scored zero of his five touchdowns. Okay. So in the games he played outside more than he did in the slot, he struggled. In the 13 other games, which he was in the slot more than he was out wide, he averaged nine and a half targets, 5.7 receptions, 69.3 yards, and scored all five of his touchdowns last year from the slot. PFF tweeted this out. Most slot catches of 15 plus yards since 2018. Tyler Boyd paces the NFL, and it's really not that close. So what's encouraging is Joe Burrow's propensity to throw the ball downfield, his air yards, and mainly when he's targeting the slot, right? You don't think of Tyler Boyd as his big play downfield guy. When I'm looking at the numbers over the last two years, Boyd has seen 25 total deep targets per PFF. Only 13 of them have been deemed catchable, okay? But he has caught all 13 of them. He has caught 13 of 13 catchable targets downfield, 20 plus yards in the air for 433 yards. Just give the boy a chance. And with Joe Burrow, he is certainly going to get those downfield throws. I would say not only is there a chance that Tyler Boyd again leads this team in targets, I would say he is the odds on favorite to do so. Like you have AJ Green there, who's, you know, we haven't seen him be durable. Dur durability is a skill, okay? We haven't seen him do it over the course of a season in a long time. They have no tight end of consequence. They have a bunch of question marks at wide receiver for the wide receiver three spot. Tyler Boyd is set up to absolutely smash as a floor play, and I don't think we have recognized his ceiling yet. So Tyler Boyd, I haven't talked on him this summer, but that is my official stance on Boyd. He's big mad. He's all over Twitter, thinks he's getting disrespected, and rightfully so. We got two more, which I will run through quickly, and then we got a beautiful, beautiful wide receiver round nine selection that we're going to get into depth like we just did with Tyler Boyd. Before we do so, though, if y'all have not copped the draft guide, which I'm going to throw up on the screen right now, it's literally the best thing you could do for your 2020 fantasy football draft, y'all. If you think the big facts that we're spitting out in here are good, you're going to be blown away by what we have in the draft guide. And we have multiple pieces of the draft guide. We have the season long guide, which has our rankings, PPR, standard, half PPR, super flex. So anything you need for your actual draft, your cheat sheet, whatever, whatever, plus our must own players at each position. We're talking about wide receivers today, but in the draft guide, we got running backs, wide receivers, quarterbacks, tight end, all the shit that y'all need in there. Every position. We got our sleepers, our undervalued players, our official do not draft list. And there are exclusive articles, exclusive videos. There's the Big Dogs Bible, which is a giant piece of exactly how to attack your 2020 fantasy football draft position by position. No matter what type of league you are in, it is my baby. It is the best piece of content I probably put out on a yearly basis. The easiest way to get the draft guide, you can literally get all this for $10 plus be able to turn that $10 into exponential revenue. Monkey Knife Fight is sponsoring the draft guide this year. So all you got to do is go to monkeyknifefight.com, deposit $10 or more using the promo code BDGE when you deposit, play a game on their website, and within 24 hours, I will email you instructions for access to the Big Dogs draft guide, the season long, the rookie dynasty guide, and Dr. Morse's complete injury guide will all be included with that access. If you are in a state that's not eligible for Monkey Knife Fight, unfortunately, you can still cop the guide on Big Dogs draft guide dot com let's talk about another guy that you are copying at an extreme discounted rate and that is julian edelman man julian edelman definitely being slept on a bit he's not a guy that i typically like to target because once i get later on into the rounds i like to shoot for upside the same case that i made for james white in yesterday's must on running backs video Edelman's like one of the only few pieces of this system that has been a constant, been producing on a year over year basis. He's the only staple of the Patriots offensive system. Like his target numbers went completely in stealth mode last year. No one is talking about it, right? A few weeks back, I talked about Allen Robinson and how much I love him this year. And I said, there were only two players that had more targets than Allen Robinson did last year. It was Michael Thomas and Julio Jones, Julian Edelman. There were only three players that had more targets than he did last year. It was Allen Robinson, Michael Thomas, and Julio Jones. 153 targets last year. So another like phenomenal under the radar season for Edelman, who has now averaged over the last three years that he has played. All right, he had the ACL, so he missed all 2017, but 2016, 2018, 2019, 9.6 targets a game, 6.2 receptions per game, 69.8 yards per game. He missed a few games two years ago. It would have been three straight 1,000 yard receiving seasons. He's still a PPR stud. And these numbers, I mean, we all know that when they get in the playoffs, Julian Edelman's numbers are out of control. So those numbers would have been skyrocketed if we're talking about games in which the Patriots really value their skilled players. And that is Mr. Julian Edelman. But those are regular season numbers. Again, PPR, eighth round, seventh round, eighth round, ninth round. Julian Edelman can be a very, very good staple for your team. Then we have Will Fuller, the last of these round seven 
seven wide receivers. I have nothing profound to say here. You're not going to find a take from me that's any different than anyone in the industry. You know, you'll hear the words, if he stays healthy, if he stays healthy, if he stays healthy. Sure, sure, sure. DeAndre Hopkins is gone. Will Fuller just does not have 140 to 150 target upside, in my opinion. He's not an alpha. He doesn't command those type of targets. In order to command those type of targets, like you need to be operating in a similar sense, probably a little bit more valuable, but in a similar sense that the way DeAndre Hopkins operated last year. Like the reason he had so many targets was because he was running a lot of shorter routes. Like he was the guy, the possession wide receiver that Deshaun Watson looked for on all those five, seven, nine yard like comeback routes. We don't see that often from Will Fuller. So yes, Will Fuller can absolutely explode and have one of those like Deshaun Jackson prime seasons, 1,200, 1,300 yards, eight touchdowns, which is definitely in the realm of possibilities if we can get 14, 15, 16 games out of Will Fuller. But the upside I think is... a like is it not as not as crazy high as a lot of people are making it out to be because he's never going to be a true alpha on the football field but all the way down here there are a lot of smart people in the industry that are getting higher and higher and higher on will fuller and that is starting to sink into my brain i don't have anything profound to say about will fuller except for he's not off my draft board if that makes sense i don't even hate brandon cook around two rounds three rounds later because i'm a little bit nervous about the houston offense overall i think their ground game is going to be terrible i think their offensive line while it's improved it's not great deshaun watson was getting smacked last year left and right like every time he dropped back it looked like he was going to get hurt so i i have and this defense is terrible i have a a feeling this team overall is just not going to be good you can make the arguments all you want about how that's going to translate into fantasy but typically i'd rather have players that are just on good nfl teams which usually translates to more points and more fantasy stats I just don't see Houston being a very good team this year. I think they're going to struggle, and it's going to translate over into the offense. But Will Fuller is a guy that I will definitely take a dart throw on in one or two of my leagues if the chance presents itself around seven, round eight, round nine. The last guy I want to break into for the big facts. I want you all to buckle up. I really want you all to tuck your shirt in for this one because this is going to we're, we're here for the long haul when it comes to Mr. Deontay Johnson of the Pittsburgh Steelers. Now, Deontay Johnson's roller coaster of an offseason – has been extremely predictable. He's one of those guys that flies under the radar and then people start to hype him up. They're like, whoa, look at what Deontay Johnson did last year. He's really good. And then the public starts to catch on and then his ADP starts to shoot up draft boards really quickly. And then all the hipsters out there are like, oh, he's no longer a good value. He's going too high for me. We hate Deontay Johnson. And then he starts to settle back down to where he probably should be. And that's what we're seeing right now. Deontay Johnson, currently the 104th player off the board at the 908. Eight. I honestly thought he was going to be going higher. You could see in best ball 10s, he's in the 83rd slot. Even that's not too uh, too crazy. I think at the peak of offseason hype, I saw him go in the sixth or seventh round of a lot of best ball leagues, which was out of control. But as you can see on like CBS, ESPN, Yahoo, the normal leagues, he's going around pick like 110, which is absolutely a perfect landing spot to get him. And even in the high stakes leagues, 96 at the back of the eighth, early ninth round, I think is probably exactly where you're shooting for. Johnson was a beast in his rookie year. He got overshadowed, obviously, by the AJ Browns, the Terry McLaurins, the DK Metcalfs, the Debo Samuels. But Johnson quietly led the Steelers in targets, receptions, touchdowns, catches of 40 plus yards, catch rate, red zone targets, and of course, fantasy points. The overall numbers at the end of the year, 59 catches, 680 yards, five touchdowns. I went back to the year 2000 because I wanted to look at how impressive that rookie year truly, truly was. So using the Rotoviz Game Screener app, which is part of their subscription service, I went back to the year 2000 and there have been a total of 727 rookie wide receivers that have played in the NFL since the year 2000. Of the 727, the total number of rookie wide receivers that have hit 90 plus targets, 55 plus receptions, 650 plus yards, and five plus touchdowns in their rookie season, 25. 25 of 727 rookie wide receivers, which is 3.4%. And when you look at the list of guys who actually did it, it is fucking impressive. We're going to scroll down. I'm just going to let you look at the list for a second. Of course, there are a few busts. There's always going to be a few busts when you start nitpicking stats. But for the most part, it gives you direction on uh, what type of player this guy probably is. So I wanted to see, okay, of those guys that had those big years, what happened in the following year? Should we expect a big jump up? What can we look at, right? I narrowed it down to players that played in at least 12 games the following year. So obviously that narrowed out anyone from this year's rookie class because we don't have numbers for their following year. And then anyone who got injured, I don't want to count that against the stats. We were left with 17 wide receivers. Of those, 13 of 17, 77% of them had more receptions the following year, an average increase of 11 and a half receptions. 13 of 17, 77%, saw more targets in year two, average increase in 14.5 targets. List goes on. 13 of 17, 77% had more receiving yards in year two, okay? 
So if you did well in your rookie year, it's probably not lucky. It's usually because you're very, very good at football. And when you're good at football, you intend to improve, right? Your rookie year, your second year, and that is what's going to happen. I expect there to be more passing volume in the Steelers offense as well compared to what we saw last year. Now, obviously, the Steelers wanted to limit their quarterback volume, the number of throws that came from their quarterback last year because their situation was an absolute shithole. They threw the ball at a rate of 57.8% in 2019, which ranked 23rd in the NFL. That was the lowest ranking for the Steelers offense since bike in 2010. A typical Tomlin team ranks within the top 12 in terms of passing rate. And then we go back to Matt Harmon and his reception perception, man. He certainly did not hate Deontay Johnson. He said, to all the people who told me I would really enjoy Deontay Johnson when charting him for reception perception, congrats, you were right. He is one of my biggest risers after charting his data 75 percent success rate versus man coverage 88th percentile 75 percent success rate versus press 81st percentile top six rookie season success rate versus man coverage scores in reception perception history you have odell tyler lockett calvin ridley terry mclaurin deontay johnson at number five michael thomas at number six the dude is a legitimate route runner he is a legitimate separator and he has a lot of antonio brown in him he was also their punt returner last year, and he took one back to the cribbo, which shows you versatility, shows you athleticism, and when you can play return man and do it well, that usually means they could line you up anywhere in the offense, and they are going to utilize you all over the field offensively, which means you're probably going to stay on the field in any type of wide receiver set, right? When you have two wide receiver sets, when you want to play 12 personnel, you want to play 11 personnel, guess what? When you're versatile, you can stay on the field for all of those snaps. What's crazy about all this, about how good his rookie year was, we just recently learned that he had been playing with a sports hernia throughout almost the entire season. It happened back in week two, and he had off-season surgery on it. So he's good to go. He had surgery back in like February. That's like a four to seven week return timetable. So he's more than 100%. It's even more impressive when you learn that he did that all with sports hernia. And he did it with these terrible quarterbacks. You look at catchable target rate, target quality rating outside of the top 80 for wide receivers last year. You want to talk about him being a separator, a route runner, a receiver's average yards of separation distance from the closest defensive back at the moment the pass target arrives. Target separation, 2.39, number one in the entire NFL among wide receivers. All in all, the signs are everywhere for the Deontay Johnson year two breakout. All they need, all they need is some consistent quarterback play here. Sure, Juju is still the guy there, but remember two years ago, Juju and Antonio Brown ranked third and fourth in targets in the NFL among wide receivers. They're not going to have that number of pass attempts in the offense, but in terms of splits, man, Deontay Johnson should see a huge increase in volume. He's a big play wide receiver. As I said, he led the team in 40 plus yard receptions. He is great versus separating man coverage, press coverage. Like he is going to find his niche in this offense. And I think it's going to be a very, 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 very valuable one. Within round seven through nine, there are a plethora of of fantastic wide receiver choices ranging from floor to ceiling to some guys who have an underrated ceiling. You have the Tyler Boyds, then you have the weekly explosion guys in Hollywood Brown and Will Fuller. Then you have Deontay Johnson, who has not really cemented himself as a fantasy stud, but the breakout flags are absolutely everywhere. I hope y'all enjoyed this video. If you did and you want to support the brand, the best way to do so, of course, is to cop the draft guide through monkey knife fight monkey knife fight.com use the promo code bdge when you deposit 10 bucks and once football starts we're going to be throwing out our best monkey knife fight plays of the week hopefully tripling quadrupling quintupling Ooh, that was nice i don't know how to say six so i'm going to stop right there your money your revenue and not only will you have had the draft guide paid for but you'll earn some revenue on top of that and make sure to check out draftnowfantasy.com get the kit board player stickers that thing forgot what the fucking name was already lombardi trophy one kit, promo code BDGE gets you 10% off plus free shipping. Have everyone chip in five bucks. You're good for your draft. I'm out. Hit that thumbs up button. Subscribe to the channel if you're new. Bunk Bad Breakdowns tomorrow. Tomorrow, tomorrow.